mentioned, so I'm a new professor here, um, and I'm part of the setup of the new bilingual biology program over at Glendon. How many people here know what Glendon is? Okay, that's actually really good. So a lot of people who uh, are at the Kiel campus have never heard of Glendon. They think we only teach in French. We're actually, uh, we historically focused uh, in the humanities and liberal arts, but there's now a resurgent of sciences. Uh, we have an excellent psychology program and the biology program as well has started. And our, all our programs, or most of our programs are bilingual. So. Uh, just wanted to introduce that a little bit. So I started here uh, at York two years ago. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about my research on reproductive competition in male primates, specifically in white-faced capuchin monkeys. So this is a very handsome fella. He's one of our alpha males uh, in one of our groups. But before I start, start telling you about my research, I want to answer one of the most common questions that I get, whether it's from friends, from family, or from the general public. And that is, why study primates? Well, the first reason is, we are primates. So we study primates to learn about ourselves. We want to understand how we are similar to other animals, and how we are unique, how we are different. In fact, some of the earliest primate studies have been traced back to 1000 BC, um, with the principal rationale for these studies being the similarity between primates and ourselves. So basically, people became interested in primates because they looked like us. And since we are primates, we also study them because of their biological similarities to us. So not only do they actually look like us, they are actually very similar to us in anatomy and physiology. A lot of behaviors are similar. They have similar evolutionary roots. And this similarity inspired early Greek scholars, like the anatomist Galen, um, to study the anatomy of monkeys and apes long before Carl Linnaeus recognized that primates and apes should be grouped together on the tree of life. Um, for this reason, primates are also often considered ideal candidates for biomedical research because of those similarities with us. Um, this similarity uh, also was the impetus for all of the uh, ape language studies that you've likely heard about that started really in the 50s and 60s um, with trying to understand the roots of language. This resemblance to us, however, has led to a tendency in asking very anthropomorphic or anthropocentric, pardon me, questions. So trying to understand primates because we want to know about ourselves, not because we actually care about the primates and actually want to know about them. Um, so this has started to change uh, in about the last 70 years. We'll get back to that uh, in a little bit more detail, but um, so one of the other reasons, and really the reason that I study primates, is I am actually inherently interested in them as organisms. Um, a lot of other people will use my research to understand the similarities and differences with humans, and I certainly use human research uh, as part of my understanding of what's going on with primates, but that's not the focus of my research. So we as humans are inherently curious about the world around us. And so for me, that is why I'm interested in primates. So we want to learn about the diversity patterns of behavior, of evolutionary forces, um, of animals around us. And so this curiosity also applies to many other disciplines. If you think about astronomy, botany, physics, we're just curious about what's going on around us. We want to understand our environment. And of course, this is becoming more and more important with the uh, climate change issues that we have and the drastic changes that we're seeing in our environment. And primates play an important role in that. Primatology itself, uh, as its own discipline, really started in the 1950s after World War II. So it's a relatively young discipline compared to things like anatomy and medicine. 
Today, primatologists really study every aspect of non-human primates. So not just anatomy and physiology, but also looking at things like ecology, so um, interactions between organisms and their environment, whether that's the physical environment or the social environment. Looking at behavior, so foraging behavior, what are they eating, mating behavior, when are they mating, who are they mating with. Um, looking at aggressive behavior, looking at reconciliation after that aggression, tool use. So these are all some of the kinds of behaviors uh, that primatologists are interested in. And also, again, those cognitive aspects. So understanding, yes, uh, language or certainly communication, understanding um, self-awareness, and also problem solving. So these are some of the very broad uh, topics that primatologists are really interested in. And so it has become really an all-encompassing discipline. It is multidisciplinary. Um, and so we have primatologists who are actually trained as anthropologists, as geneticists, um, as psychologists, as anatomists, uh, really in many, many disciplines as psychologists. So primates, primatologists, we kind of like to touch base on a lot of different fields. Okay, so what about my research? I consider myself a primate behavioral ecologist, so I'm interested in uh, primate behavior within the social and physical environment in which they live in the wild. And I also study hormones, so I can also call myself a primate behavioral endocrinologist, so endocrine hormone system. I'm interested in questions about how individuals navigate the complexities associated with living in social groups. As we all know, when you live in groups, you interact with individuals, tensions can arise, but sometimes those tensions have to be abated because you need to cooperate. So how, how are these uh, kinds of relationships navigated? So to examine these questions, I collect behavioral data in the field, so on the ground in the primate's natural habitat. And I also collect fecal samples. That's right. I collect poo. I have a PhD in poop. Um, and a postdoc as well, just in case you're wondering. So I'm very poop certified. Um, and so I do this because the fecal samples are really helpful in, uh, they allow me to analyze hormone levels. So these are ways that by combining these two methods of field work and lab work, I can look at different aspects of reproductive competition. I also work with a number of collaborators who can look at other aspects of health, such as nutrition, uh, gastrointestinal parasites, and also genetics. So let me move on a little bit um, on uh, presenting you with a little bit of background in reproduction to put my own research in context. So one of the major concepts in behavioral ecology is the idea that female reproduction is more energetically expensive than male reproduction. And so female mammals in particular bear a high cost for reproduction. This begins with a higher initial investment in gametes, so in ovules, which are relatively energetically expensive to produce compared to that cheap sperm. <laughs> in mammals, that cost continues because of internal fertilization, uh, which is followed by an obligate investment in terms of gestation. On top of that, you gotta add lactation, and as we know, in many mammals, including primates, especially humans, there is a long period of infant, juvenile, teenager, adult dependency. <laughs> so that investment doesn't end at lactation. Can we all agree on that? So you can see that the cost is very high. And while this paradigm of high costs for females is really important in helping us to understand and develop predictions about behavior, uh, behavioral differences and physiological differences in sex, it has also led on this emphasis 
on female reproduction in terms of the costs of female reproduction. In contrast, the, the research for males has really focused on the benefits of reproduction, essentially saying, oh, costs are not so important. The females have the high costs, the males have the high benefits. And specifically, I'm talking about high reproductive success when I'm talking about uh, the benefits. Um, so the high reproductive success of males who invest a lot in reproduction, whether that's in terms of aggression to obtain a territory or um, weapons like antlers or these elephant seals who uh, basically fight to obtain a territory. Um, this in turn has led to a de-emphasis on the costs of reproduction for males. But these costs can actually have important fitness consequences if there's a trade-off between the amount of energy you invest in reproduction and survival. So you only have a certain amount of energy to give. It's like a pie. If you give a big piece of the pie to your cousin, there's less pie left for you. So if you invest a lot of your pie, a lot of your energy in reproduction, there's less left over to maintain your body, to be healthy, and it can negatively impact survival. And in many mammals where males and females come together for a short period, like a breeding season, uh, we see that males often invest a great deal in secondary sex characteristics. So these are things like antlers, that kind of weaponry, or some really lovely tail feathers. These are secondary sex characteristics that are related to reproduction that males invest in a lot in these species. Um, males may engage in aggressive competition over a territory, and the winner of that territory often gets priority of access to the females in that area, and he's the preferred mate of the females. But these contests and these investments in secondary sex characteristics can not only be costly in terms of energy expenditure, but they can also lead to injury and result in death. Among primates, however, the trend is for males and females to live together year round. So you don't have females on one side and males on the other, and they just come together to reproduce and then they go off on their own way, which you have in a lot of other species. So they really form these uh, social units where you have males and females living together throughout the year. Primate social organization is highly variable. You can have small groups with a single male and a single female, and you can have very, very large multi-male, multi-female groups. So we can sort of, if we're looking at it from the male perspective, we can see there can be groups with just one male, so unimale groups, or groups that have multiple males, so multi-male groups. In one male groups, males have to compete against males from outside of the group, right? So there's between group competition between those males because they're trying to keep those other males from gaining group membership and therefore potential access to the females in that group. But there's no competition within the group because there's just one male, so he's not competing with himself. Similarly, in groups with multiple males, the males have to compete against other groups of males to try and prevent them from coming into the group and gaining access to those females. However, in addition, they also have to deal with competition among males within the group, so among the co-resident males of that social group. So in doing so, these males have to balance the need for cooperation in order to compete against those uh, males outside the group, but they also still have to compete within the group. And so that balance there might have an influence on how males express that competition within the group. Males can compete via a dominance hierarchy, which is generally defined as priority of access to resources. This can be food, which is generally what females compete for, 
And for males, this resource is usually access to fertile females. This mechanism of dominance is a way for males to avoid unnecessary physical aggression and the risk of injury when the competitive abilities of the different males have been established. So oftentimes you'll have some initial jostling, but once you know that you're weaker than the other guy, there's really no benefit in keeping on going, right? You just say, I get it, I'm, I'm second in command. So um, what you get is, um, or one of the things that you can get is these sort of dominance hierarchies that are helpful for reducing aggression. They're really kind of a way of maintaining social stability within the group. But dominance is a social construct. It happens in a social environment. So it's not only important to consider the individual competitive, uh, competitive ability of those males, but also the context in which this is happening. This isn't just two males. You might have three or four males. So you can really get a variety of different kinds of dominance relationships within groups. And so you can get something like the typical dominance hierarchy that we think of where it's very strict and very linear. Male A dominance, dominates male B, male B dominates male C, A dominates all of them, and so on down the line. But you can also have a very, very weak dominance hierarchy or really no dominance hierarchy among the males at all. Or you can get something kind of in between where you have one dominant alpha male and a number of lower ranking subordinate males. Males may also compete via sperm competition. Sperm competition may also be important when the costs of aggressive competition are really high, such as when males are competing against other males within their group or against their relatives. So if you're wondering what this little graph is here, I'll let you guess what the two little balls there on the bottom are, and the male symbol represents body size. So this shows you the relative body size of the testicles to the body size of males in these different species. So we shouldn't be totally embarrassed, but you know, let's not get naked next to a bonobo, right? Because <laughs> I'm just saying. So with that, little bit of background on reproduction in mammals and in primates in particular, let me now turn to the white-faced capuchins that I studied in Costa Rica. Um, and I'm going to explain to you why they're an interesting species in which to study uh, reproductive competition, including dominance. So all of my research took place in Santa Rosa National Park, which is in the northwest of Costa Rica. Behavioral and demographic research uh, in this park on the capuchins has been ongoing since the early 1980s. This is one of the longest running field sites uh, in the world. It was started by a Canadian, Dr. Linda Fedigan, who's just retired from the University of Calgary um, and has been ongoing with the contribution of her collaborators and students. So white-faced capuchins are medium-sized neotropical primates. So they're about the size of a big fat house cat. Um, and they live in groups of multiple related females, immigrant males, and immatures, so infants and juveniles. Males leave their birth group around four and a half years old, and they continue to change groups throughout their lives about every four years. So this is why the females are related. They stay in their birth group, and the males are uh, immigrants because they're changing groups. They don't stay in their birth group. So co-resident males, males that live within the same group, tend to be affiliative. So they're kind of friendly with each other. They'll groom each other. They get along. They have very low rates of aggression. And they also cooperate in these intergroup encounters. So where uh, two groups of monkeys uh, meet one another. They also have a fairly egalitarian mating system. So all the males, whether they're the highest ranking male, lower ranking, uh, or the lowest really, uh, participate in mating. So all males mate with group females. 
That being said, there is still a very clearly identifiable alpha male. If I took you into the field, within one hour, you would be able to tell the alpha male. So here you have three different uh, age and dominant status for our males. So on the left, you have a sub-adult males. So these are males who are like teenagers. So they're almost the size of adults, but they're still kind of gangly. They're still kind of figuring out what's going on with their body. Um, but they, you know, they want to participate. They want to be adults. So these are males that are about 6 to 10 years old. Then you have adult males. So they don't become adults until they're 10 years old. And then some of our adult males become alpha. Not all males can become the highest ranking male in a group. So what you'll notice with this male, uh, sorry, this male here, so the one on your left, this is, uh, again, this is Baba Ganoush, who I've already introduced you on uh, the head slide. So he was the alpha male in one of our groups. And if you look beyond the scars, every alpha male has these uh, characteristics in common. They have really wide brows, really wide chin, uh, sorry, jaw, and they also appear larger overall. So it takes a little bit of time, but within an hour you can tell this male. So he's readily identified by his appearance, and also uh, females and infants do this special vocalization towards the alpha male only. So that's another way to identify who he is. Alpha males are... Uh, often the most active participants in these intergroup encounters, but all of the males in the group do actually participate in these between group contests. These uh, encounters are thought to be part of a long-term reproductive strategy in which the white-faced capuchin males uh, during these encounters are able to assess the composition of neighboring groups and decide if that's a good group that they want to take over. So maybe there's a weak male or there's very few males. Uh, there's lots of fertile females, so it's a good time to try and enter that group. Or maybe it's a really bad time because there's lots of males and the females, you know, they all have babies. It's not a good time. So this, um, basically these... Uh, intergroup encounters uh, may play a role in these dispersal decisions that males have to make. And intergroup encounters can result in aggressive takeovers. So sometimes when the males have these encounters, one group of male will actually come in, take over an existing group, and either evict the resident males, or they will lose their dominant status. So they basically go down the hierarchy. Intergroup encounters also pose a threat to resident males because they can result in injury, such as this severe gash that the male suffered here, or even death. And again, these takeovers can lead to uh, loss of dominance rank or even complete eviction from the group. Takeovers are also often associated with infanticide. Oh, it's okay to go on. It's very sad for us too, even as scientists. We want to collect the data, but at the same time, we're like, no. Um, so what we see is that in years in which a takeover occurred, 82% of infants died or disappeared. This is compared to only 12% during socially stable years. So if you assume that 12% is because maybe the mom didn't know what she was doing, or it was really, really dry, or there wasn't enough food, where does that other 70% come from in those unstable years? So it's likely because of infanticide. So these are all factors, these group evictions, loss of dominance rank, risk of injury, uh, risk of infanticide, um, that are things that can negatively impact a male's reproductive success. And they suggest that reproductive competition between groups of male capuchins is very high. It turns out there's also another way that we can look at competition, and that's to look at hormones. So androgens are a group of hormones, which include testosterone, that's one that most of us have heard of, and also dihydrotestosterone, androstenedione, so it's a whole group of hormones. 
And together, these hormones are responsible for uh, maintaining basic reproductive functions, so things like sperm production. But they're also associated with reproductive effort. This reproductive effort can be overt, so things like aggression, uh, actively fighting over access to a female, or they can be more covert, things like vocalizations, mate guarding a female, so you're hanging around, you're not being aggressive, but you're making it clear to everybody that you got your eyes all the way around your head. So these are things that um, are, we would consider as forms of um, reproductive effort. So I predicted that with this reproductive competition, we should see high levels of intergroup, uh, sorry, high levels of androgens when these intergroup encounters are common. But again, how do you test hormones in wild animals? I already mentioned how much I love poop. <laughs> like most uh, wild or field biologists, wild biologists, we are a little bit wild as well, um, field biologists, we love poo because you can examine hormone levels, but you can look at, again, genetics to confirm reproductive success instead of just looking at mating behavior because they might not always correlate. You can look at disease, so things like parasites. You can even now look at viruses in the poop. You can look at nutritional sampling. So there's a lot of stuff that you can look at with uh, feces. In captivity, it's much easier. You can do blood samples. But we really try, my research group and I really try to use non-invasive research methods whenever possible. So, um, well, that wasn't supposed to show up right away. But I'm already giving you the answer here about what I found. But basically what we do is um, my team and I went out into the field for six months, which uh, January to June, where we looked at um, behavior. We basically spent 1,200 hours with all the males in three different social groups. And we recorded a bunch of behavior, including every instance where we had an intergroup encounter. We also collected fecal samples, lots of them. And we analyzed the hormones back in the lab at the Wisconsin National Primate Center, where there is a lab that specializes in these hormone analyses. And so lo and behold, I found consistent with my prediction that there was a positive relationship between androgens and intergroup encounters, suggesting that, yes, they are in fact, that aggression that happens during those intergroups is in fact related to reproductive competition. But as a good scientist, just because I found what I was predicting doesn't mean that I was right. I really have to ask myself, hmm, maybe there's some other factors that could have led to this increase in androgen levels. Um, so births and conceptions in capuchin monkeys can occur throughout the year. This is what we call a rose diagram. You basically see the months around a circle and then that bar going towards the different months is telling you how often a particular event is happening. So here we're talking about conceptions. And um, so I already knew that conceptions might be occurring during my study period because again, I was there from January to June and there's that period where there's lots and lots of conceptions. It also happens that this is when most of the intergroup encounters occur. So maybe the androgen increase has nothing to do with intergroup encounters and everything to do with the fact that there are some good looking fertile females, ovulatory females around in the group. So I knew that female, this was a potential confound, but the problem with capuchins is they don't have any lovely external signs of ovulation. Unlike these baboon females, which get a big sexual swelling around the time of ovulation. So that's that key time to conceive. So how can I look at uh, this uh, ovulation, right? If I don't have any external physical signs or behavioral signs. Well, instead, capuchins are more like human females, um, where they have what we call concealed ovulation. So this makes it a lot harder as a human observer to figure out what's going on. So um, what we see here is in concealed ovulation, there are no behavioral signs, no really overt, obvious signs of ovulation. 
But what you can see here are two composite images of females. One of them is a composite image of females when they were ovulating. The other is a composite of those same females when they're not ovulating. Now you can probably see they look slightly different. Very similar, obviously, but there are some subtle differences. So it turns out that humans are able to detect these differences and recognize these very subtle differences on a subconscious basis in terms of which face is more attractive. So I'm sure you're all dying to know which one is the ovulatory female. <laughs> it's the one on the, I guess this is, yeah, on your left. Um, so since I knew that androgen levels could increase uh, in response to female ovulation, as we see in humans, I had actually known this before I went into the field. So not only had I collected male fecal samples, I collected female fecal samples, lots of them. You have to collect them every three days so that you can try and detect the pattern of progesterone and estrogen levels in the feces because these are hormones that are related to female ovulation. So that's what I had done. And as luck would have it, all 17 of my adult and subadult females were not ovulating. So this means they were either pregnant, they were nursing, or they just weren't cycling yet. So this was both good and bad in that it was actually a natural way to control for that confound, right? Remember I said that maybe androgen levels are going up because males are responding to the presence of ovulatory females, which is the, when conception can occur. And I knew, ooh, lots of conceptions occur in January and February. Just by chance, I was able to control for that. So during this time, we still had sexual behaviors, including copulations. Um, so it's possible that some of the androgen increase is related to sexual behavior, but we know that it's not related to the presence of fertile females. So that is still supporting my hypothesis that yes, there is high intergroup encounter, uh, high intergroup comp reproductive competition between uh, males in this species. Okay, so what about competition within groups? Um, among the co-resident males. And how does this relate to the high between group com uh, competition? So remember that while interactions between males of different groups are oftentimes aggressive, males within groups are friendly, uh, they groom one another, they're very tolerant, um, aggression is low, and uh, all males participate in the mating system. There's very rare copulatory harassment. They don't like go and chase each other off if they see another male mating. Well, it's actually been suggested that um, the low rates of aggression among the males within the group is because they do have to cooperate with one another in between group competition. So they basically can't afford to be too mean to each other within the groups or they're gonna lose their uh, cooperative peers. In other words, the need for co-resident males to cooperate in competition limits how competition within the group can be expressed. And this was also proposed as the explanation for the mating distribution in the resident males. So remember I mentioned that they have a fairly egalitarian mating system with all males mating with group females. The idea is that in exchange for participation in group defense, alpha males are allowing all the males in the group to have a share of reproduction. Kind of a tit for tat exchange. Um, and again, even though we have that clearly identifiable alpha male, he's only getting slightly more copulations than you would expect just by chance. So fairly evenly spread out. So the question is, well, why bother being alpha if you're not getting a reproductive benefit out of it? You're putting in effort, energy to become this alpha male. What's the benefit? Um, so the question is, okay, so there is low mating skew in terms of who's mating with whom, but that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about the genetic paternity. 
So just because everybody is mating doesn't mean everybody is actually siring offspring. So one thing to test was, okay, let's look at some fecal samples again and figure out if all of the males are siring offspring. Well, um, as it turns out, alpha males sire up to 100% of the offspring in their groups. It ranges from about 69 uh, to 100%. So there is very high reproductive skew in terms of the actual paternity. So that's the benefit of being an alpha male. But how are the alpha males achieving these benefits? So even though um, female capuchins have concealed ovulations and I can't tell when they're ovulating, we as human observers can't tell when they're ovulating, doesn't mean the capuchin males aren't smarter than us and maybe they can tell in the same way that human males are able to detect female ovulation. It's not a conscious um, perception or a, a conscious perception of ovulation, but there's a preference for ovulatory females. So I hypothesized that um, alpha males were actually mating with females when those females were ovulating, and the subordinate, lower ranking males, were mating with the females when they were not ovulating. Basically, they were making the best of a bad situation in the hopes that, oh, maybe I'll get some paternity in there, but who knows. <laughs> so. I've already talked about how um, androgens, including testosterone, are associated with reproductive aggression and male reproductive effort. So if testosterone and androgens are a good proxy for this reproductive effort, I predicted that uh, males, if they can in fact detect ovulation, would compete more when there were ovulatory females present than when there were no ovulating females. So I predicted that their testosterone levels would go up. I also predicted, based on the fact that the alpha male is siring all of these offspring, that alpha males would have higher testosterone levels than those subordinate males. So this time, remember the first time I went into the field, none of my females were ovulating. So I couldn't have done this project at that time. So this time I was like, okay, I'm gonna make sure I get some ovulatory females. So I went for 18 months and collected thousands of fecal samples. <laughs> lots and lots of behavioral data. Um, and so I had 28 females, I had 14 males across three different social groups. We collected lots of behavioral obs uh, observations, including any uh, occurrences of social sexual behavior, including copulations. We then looked at hormone levels in the lab, uh, so testosterone levels in the males and estrogen and progesterone in the females to look at, uh, to identify when they were ovulating. I had a lot more luck this time around. Um, I think it was 16 of my females, let me see here. Uh, oh, I had 28 ovulatory periods. Uh, 12 of which resulted in conceptions. So I was a lot luckier this time around in terms of being able to test this hypothesis. So let's look at the results. So just a quick reminder. Um, I hypothesized that if the males were able to detect female ovulation, their testosterone levels would be higher when those females, ovulatory females are present in the group than when none of the females in the group are ovulating. So here I would like you to ignore the x-axis, which just looks at our different categories of males, and instead focus on the difference between the red bars and the gray bars. So the gray bars represent when ovulatory females were not present in the group, so all of the females were anovulatory. Red represents when one or more female in the group was ovulating. And what you can clearly see is that Testosterone levels are higher in the presence of ovulatory females um, than when the females are not ovulating. So this indicates that males have a hormone response to female ovulation. Um, 
If you now look at the x-axis, which represents those different male ages, so we have our alpha male, which is our highest ranking adult male. Then we have our subordinate, so lower ranking adult males. And then we have our lowest ranking youngest males, the subadults. So you can see that it's not just the alpha male who had this response. All males, regardless of their age and rank, responded to female ovulation with increased testosterone levels and presumably increased uh, investment in reproductive competition. So again, this is consistent with the idea that male reproductive effort goes up in the presence of ovulatory females and that they are able to detect female ovulation, even though there's no obvious behavioral or external physical signs. Also as predicted, alpha males had higher testosterone levels than subadult uh, males and subordinate adult males. Again, given that alpha males sire the majority of group offsprings, this result um, is perhaps not too surprising, but it is consistent with the idea that they uh, invest more in reproduction than subordinate males. But it's still surprising actually, uh, or it was to me, um, that their testosterone levels were so much higher than the other males, given how low aggression is within groups. Um, so, since males appear to uh, detect female ovulation, all the males, regardless of um, rank and sex, do alpha males indeed copulate more with ovulatory females and subordinate males with anovulatory females? So first, I was able to confirm uh, previous reports that there is low mating skew, so there's not a lot of differences in who's mating with whom. Um, with alpha males obtaining only slightly higher proportion of uh, copulations than you would expect by chance. So during those 18 months that my team and I were in the field, we observed 145 copulations, which is a pretty good number. Out of those 145, though, only five occurred with ovulatory females. That means 140 copulations were with anovulatory females. Okay, so of those five copulations, how many do you think were with alpha males? Five. That's what I would have thought too. Wrong. <laughs> but at least we're wrong together. One of them was with an alpha male. Okay, so surely then the rest must go to the adults, right? Wrong again. <laughs> So in this case, it turns out three of those copulations that occurred with ovulatory females involved subadult subordinate males, so low-ranking teenagers, basically. <laughs> and two of these involved the same male. What's interesting, this male, years later, became an alpha male. So. Who knows what's going on there? And that's the problem, is we don't know what's going on there. So even despite spending all of this time in the field collecting lots and lots of behavioral observations, lots and lots of observed copulations, our sample size for copulations during ovulation are still really, really small. So um, while we don't know exactly how they're doing it, we do know that males can detect female ovulation, Alpha males have higher testosterone levels than subordinate males. And alpha males are siring the majority of group offspring, so there's clearly a very important benefit to being an alpha male. But the fact that not all males become, not all adult males are able to become and remain alpha males suggests that there are also costs associated with high dominance. So again, we already know that alpha males have higher testosterone levels than subordinates, but is alpha status also associated with higher stress levels? We can look again at poo, um, looking at hormones, a group of hormones called glucocorticoids. 
So these are hormones like cortisol, which is the most common glucocorticoid in primates, including humans. Um, others include corticosterone. Um, but these are most frequently associated with the body's stress response. Short-term increases in glucocorticoids are adaptive. If there's a cheetah chasing you, you really want your cortisol levels to go up because what they do is they mobilize energy for what is currently needed at the expense of what is not really needed. So basically, they might move energy away from reproduction, which while the cheetah's chasing you is really not that important, to energy in terms of running away, which is useful in that moment. So short-term increases in glucocorticoids are adaptive. But when you have repeated or chronic increases in glucocorticoids, you can have these very high levels. And it turns out that if these levels are maintained for long periods of time, they seem to have a negative effect. They can be immunosuppressive. So basically, they lower your ability to fight off infections. So um, I analyzed those glucocorticoids in the same fecal samples I had collected to look at testosterone levels. Um, and I used glucocorticoids as a way to evaluate if there was a cost of dominance. So what do we get? Again, here we see two things. Alpha males have higher cortisol levels, corticosterone, blah, glucocorticoid levels than subordinate males, whether those are adults or subadults. And we also see that there's a cost to increased reproductive effort because their androgen, their glucocorticoid levels are going up in the presence of ovulatory females. So um, even though this difference might seem very small because this is a log transformed scale, uh, it is a statistically significant difference. Whether it's biologically significant is another question, um, but just I don't want you to be deterred by the fact that it doesn't look uh, different. Oh yeah, and here's the other one. So we also see that, again, there's an increase in those levels in the presence of ovulatory females at the same time that those androgen levels are going up. So, um, again, while both of these hormones, testosterone and glucocorticoids, have some benefits, they can also suppress the immune system, um, but it's extremely difficult to measure health non-invasively in wild primates. One option is to collect, you guessed it, parasites uh, in fecal samples um, to look at gastrointestinal parasites as an indicator of health. So if testosterone and glucocorticoid levels or high levels are immunosuppressive, we might expect that alpha males have higher parasites because they're immunosuppressed. On the other hand, maybe alpha males just have better genes. They're just uh, healthier, generally, so they can actually withstand the immunosuppressive effects of testosterone and glucocorticoids. So again, in addition to collecting fecal samples for hormones and for those paternity analyses, I also collected them to look at parasites. And preliminary results for two of the three study groups uh, looking at parasite species richness. So this is not how many eggs of parasites are shed in their feces, but just the number of different species. Uh, so species A, species B, species C, as opposed to lots and lots of species A. And so what you see is uh, that the alpha males in the hashed bar do have one to two more parasite species present in their feces relative to the subordinate males. Again, whether this is a biologically significant difference is difficult to tell. It seems that for uh, parasites in primates, a lot of the uh, effects are subclinical, so they might be slightly lethargic, uh, but there's no obvious uh, signs of illness. So to what extent these parasites actually are a true cost is still not known. So, in summary, 
What I'd like you to take away from uh, today is that male capuchins engage in reproductive competition between groups, but also within groups. So between groups, uh, we see that intergroup encounters are associated with higher androgen levels, um, suggesting that this is, again, a form of reproductive competition that the males face. Within groups, we have very little behavioral evidence of competition. Remember, males are friendly, they're tolerant, they get along, there's very low aggression, uh, they don't harass each other while copulating, um, and they have that sort of egalitarian mating system. But when you look at the genetics of paternity and the hormones, those are both suggesting that there is very high reproductive competition within the group, but it's not expressed aggressively. So this leaves a potential role for sperm competition in this species, as that being the primary way in which males compete within groups for uh, reproductive status. Um, again, we saw that alpha males have very high benefits of that dominance rank. They are siring the vast majority of offspring within their groups, but there may be costs associated with that high rank. Those results are still inconclusive. So that's our little summary for today. Um, as you may know, uh, research is extremely time intensive and financially intensive. And so I would like to thank my collaborators, including the many field assistants I worked with, as well as my uh, scientific collaborators, and of course the vast number of funding agencies that contribute to this research. And this includes universities. So all universities contribute to their researchers' uh, expenses. Um, so again, this is uh, quite an important part of our work, is not only conducting the research, but getting the money to conduct the research. The time is another thing. I'm still working on that one. 